There's so many topics we're gonna to discuss in today's lesson. For example, I'm gonna share with you tips on growing successfully a lot of lemons, such as behind, but you can apply to other fruit trees. Or when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade, but how much? Saving a dying, yes, in fact, this is a dying, young, productive fruit tree. And when life gives you lemons, the real tip here is pick them. So in today's lesson, what we're really doing is saving a stressed out, productive, young fruit tree. And we're gonna get that done together. Hi, my name is Charles Malky, biosystem plant expert with Ivory Gangs, where we grow cool plants and author of Saving the World with the Home Garden. And right now, get your autographed copy of our book at ivyorganics.com, where you also find our innovative, organic, effective, and USA made products for your whitewashing needs, pest control, transplant shock, and organic fertilizers. Additionally, get your hands on some Dave Wilson nursery fruit trees, including pomegranates, grapes, and select berries. So if a dog, a cat, or even a person has just one baby, it requires a lot of additional energy, more food, more water, just, uh, and also just the weight alone is pretty stressful on that person. However, if that dog, cat, or person had two babies, it's not twice as much, but it's significantly more energy, more food requirements, more water requirements, and even more weight on that individual. The average human baby weighs between five and eight pounds. However, when Octomom had her eight children, those babies weighed between one and a half pounds and three and a half pounds. Similarly, the point is with a Eureka lemon or whatever your fruit tree is on your property, the more fruit it's carrying, the chances are the size of the fruit is gonna be smaller. So by picking the fruit and even especially by thinning the fruit, you're going to end up having better quality, larger fruit that are in fact even better tasting too. Before we continue, let me just share with you an example about a fruit tree carrying just way too much. I know this is a lot here, but let me show you another example of a tree that's truly suffering here on the property because we did not thin it nor really manage it properly from the get-go. Follow me. So this here to my left is our Dapple Supreme Intraspecific Zager fruit tree that we planted together about four years ago now. And what's so special about it is it's a cross as a pluot between a plum and an apricot. So it kind of has the flavors of both. And it was Floyd Zager for the last 40 years that has been crossing some of the best fruit trees and keeping track of the parent trees and using that pollen and that fruit to create some of the best tasting fruits in the world. So this Dapple Supreme Pluot is a cross between the Dapple Dandy, that's one of the parents, and the other one is Flavor Supreme. And the cross between those two parents created the Dapple Supreme Intraspecific Pluot here on our property. And check out all of these fruit. Looks exciting, right? We've got all of this delicious fruit. But if you focus and come in maybe a little bit closer, you'll notice that even the bigger fruit here is quite small, probably about half the size of what it otherwise should have been. And then you've got these other smaller ones. And the reason that these fruit are so small, as we just mentioned, is that it's carrying a lot of fruit. So these branches are carrying so much fruit. But check this out. The branches are breaking. And the structure that I've worked so hard over the last few years, creating and, and selecting the right branches are now breaking and now this is another issue that needs to be addressed. So here we are now late June going into July. And what we should have done in that first month after the bloom period is we should have approached those fruit while they're the size of a dime and or between the size of a nickel. That's what most experts will say. And while the fruit is between this size, some people suggest even thinning flowers, I've heard, um, which is ludicrous because there's about 10 times, if not 100 times more flowers and fruit. So you wait for the fruit to set and begin developing somewhere between a diamond and nickel, and then you thin it out. And where you see these clusters of three or more, they should have been thinned down to maybe one, maximum two. And that would have reduced the load and we would have had much better size quality fruit on this tree that would not be breaking as what's happening here today. Well, let's get back to our Eureka lemon. Another important consideration for thinning fruit is, especially for trees that are alternate bearing, is that by thinning the fruit and lessening the load, the risk of that tree being an alternate bearing tree, where it basically regains its strength between years that it gives fruit, is reduced. So you can actually get to enjoy more fruit 
off that tree from year to year consistently compared to having one heavy load followed by a year with very little to no fruit. So there's three primary issues that I spotted that is affecting this tree behind me. Let me share those with you before we then address the remedies and how we're gonna correct it to breathe new life into this fruit tree. So let's come in a little closer to spot issue number one. Check this out. So issue number one is that the tree should be a lot greener than it is right now. And most of the growing tips are very pale yellow to light green, as you can see here in this area. Um, I was surprised to see that just behind these leaves, we've got the fruiting body of basically later this year to early next year's lemon. And if you come in over here, you can see the same thing. These are a little bit greener, better condition. But again, it's not as green as it should be. And the second primary issue is it's not pushing out new growth virtually at all. Most of these grow tips are a growth that happened mostly last year. This here is an example of growth that happened this year. And you can see, again, last year's leaves, these are basically the solar panels. They last about a year on the tree, sometimes up to two, and then they fall and they get replaced by all the new growth. So here's an example of new growth, but there's not that much of that happening. Here's a little bit more new growth. And you can see just behind it, I'm not too concerned about the solar panels behind it that are a little bit faded. But again, even the new growth could be looking a lot better than what it is right now. One more example on leaves. You can see, again, it's very minimal amount of growth relative to all of this exposure of wood that should otherwise be protected with the leaf and the green canopy protecting the understory of these branches so that it'll improve the longevity and health of the tree. So issue one, color of the leaves. Two minimal growth. Issue number three is there's too much light penetration. In fact, I've never seen this much light entering the canopy of the tree as what's going on right now. Again, late June, going into July, we have the hottest months here in Los Angeles coming in August. And we've got 14 hours of daylight and this tree is unprotected. And usually I'll protect the heart of the tree, which is the tree trunk and lower branches. And then sometimes if some of the extremities of the tree get sunburnt, and we have demonstrator of the years, examples of what sunburn damage looks like. And again, trees like people can suffer first, second, or third degree burns. And what you can see here is if you come in just out here, you'll see that it's minimal leaves and a lot of wood exposure. And you can see the burn that's already happening on these sun exposed surfaces the top turning brown and black compared to the understory, which is shaded, which still remains green. And it's not just the hardening of the wood that's creating the color change. It's in fact burn that's happening to the plant. And you can see again, all of the light that's happening on these stems throughout the entire tree structure. This here is in particular is catching my eye. If you can see where my hand is, you can see this is a lot of sun hitting a about a two to three year old branch. And this here is gonna end up burning and getting damaged. And any life that you see that's happening on this branch in the future is gonna be happening from the under shaded story of the branch if it continues you know, to thrive and perform. But all of this is imposes risk to the overall health and the longevity that we hope to keep this tree on our property for many more decades to come. So now let's remedy the issues. Again, to give this tree as much health and life as possible to remain on our property for many, many more years to come. And I've got five helpful tips. And the first one is going to be remove the fruit. Kind of as when we started, when life gives you lemons, yes, make lemonade, but also pick your fruit. Don't just let them sit on your tree because they're sucking resources. They're consuming elements, they're consuming water, and they're adding additional weight to the tree and it's stressing your plants out. And if you care about reducing the stress on your plants so that they can be happy and healthy for a longer period of time on your property, remove the fruit when they give you fruit. And we're going to deal with how we're going to end up hopefully sharing these fruit. One thing I like to do as well is, and you've seen this in years past, like our Meyer lemon trees, we'd usually harvest over 100 pounds of lemons in a very short period of time, as little as one or two months on our property. Most of them come ripe. For some of you, you end up um, keeping those lemons on your tree a little bit longer. I particularly like the Eureka lemon because 
These are lemons that have been ripe since January, and here we are in June going into July. And between August and September is pretty much when all the fruit will fall off your tree. And that's when you'll see usually citrus prices soaring at the grocery store because there's very limited lemons in the country at that time of the year. So, and that's another reason to consider maybe creating your fresh squeezed lemon cubes that they can store in your freezer. By having your frozen lemon cubes ready in the freezer during those times when production is at its lowest and prices at the store are the highest. And by doing so, hopefully you'll get to enjoy fresh homegrown lemons throughout the year. To maximize the longevity of your fruit harvest, try to include some of the stem with the fruit. If you simply pull the stem out of the fruit, it can create an air pocket that'll immediately start beginning the rotting process at the head of the lemon. So try to keep some of the stems on. That's why I'm going in with my pruners. I'm trying to keep the fruit together. I'm gonna to separate these for easier washing. So we've just thinned about 95% of the crop and let's just give this a quick way to find out how much weight we've just taken off of this one Eureka lemon tree. For those of you that don't know, the Eureka lemon is one of the most popular store-bought, typical lemon flavor lemon that you're looking for compared to the Meyer lemons that we also grow here and again, harvest about 100 pounds a year. Those are the sweet lemons. So if you ever usually baking with it or you're just trying to get a flavor that's unique the Meyer lemon is the way to go but again the Eureka lemon is one of the most popular again store-bought variety lemon um stores well transports well stays on a tree a long time um and the only other competition it has that's similar tasting and um size quality so forth is the Lisbon lemon some say it's a little bit more cold hardy so if there's a risk of freeze the Lisbon might be the way to go for you but the Lisbon and Eureka lemon are some of California's most popularly grown lemon varieties. And here we go, putting it on the scale here. Let's give it a second or two to read the weight and then I'll remove it and here we go. Let's see what we've done. And it shows, what is that? 103 pounds, 0.8. That's insane. We've taken off over 100 pounds of load off of this one Eureka lemon tree. It is saying thank you, thank you, thank you right now. Well, let's get on now to helpful tip number two. So helpful tip number two is pruning. And even though, again, here we are late June going into July, and most people are not thinking about pruning their trees, it is advisable by most fruit tree experts that summer pruning is a good thing but you're supposed to limit the pruning to those branches that have grown within that calendar year. And I'm not saying, for example, necessarily that growth from January through June, but any growth that's less than the last 12 months, it's generally safe to prune and the plant won't stress that badly from it. Um, compared to, for example, we've done a video where in August we did a lesson called Why Prune the Giving Fig Tree, and we cut it down to a stump that was just a couple of feet. And um, some of you have seen the success of what we accomplished there, but that is not advisable, not recommended. But again, we had a goal in mind, and fortunately it unfolded the way we wanted. But here, all we're doing is pruning growth that's less than a year by simply bringing the height back in check to make sure that that fruit harvest is within reach. By removing the height, what we're doing is now encouraging lower growth. Check out how low we've got fruit on the tree we're literally inches away from the ground and we've got fruit all the way throughout i'm measuring six feet tall my reach is eight and that's kind of my goal is to keep the plant between eight maximum nine feet tall this is a semi-standard rootstock unchecked unpruned this tree would easily grow to about 15 feet so twice the size that you see here today so by pruning some of these tips off Plants, just like people, have hormones. By removing these growth tips, which are predominantly high in auxins, will now skew the balance of hormones within the plants. The cytokinins are in the root, 
with less auxins and more cytokinins, it's going to encourage more plant growth from the root up. So again, it's going to improve the bushiness of the overall structure by removing some of these top auxin rich growth. And again, even this new growth here that we've had from just this past few months, we can cut it in half. Again, removing more auxin growth will now stimulate more vigorous growth throughout this entire area. The other thing you're pruning for also is sometimes you get a strangler branch, like in this example over here. You'll see that there's some growth that's coming into the zone of the next fruit tree. Just next to it over here, we've got the ponderosa lemon. Let's see if we've got any fruit. Check this out over here. The ponderosa lemon, one of the largest of the lemon varieties. And when we did a taste test, the flavor of the ponderosa lemon was considered superior compared to that of the Eureka or Lisbon variety lemons. Um, this here again is the Ponderosa, a delicious tasting lemon. And again, to make sure that each of these plants stay in its zones. And again, by pruning, you can increase the density of having more varieties of fruit trees on your property. So again, any of these strangler branches, we can manage the tree shape to allow for maximum density planting. So here's a couple more lemons that came off that we can add to the box. So now we're at a little more than 103 pounds. With the prunes, just to quickly um, share, I feel like I've already taught this, and I know I have probably 100 times, but for those of you watching this for the first time, if you take a look, what I'm pretty much doing with all the cuts is I'm following the nodes, and I'm simply cutting at where the next nearest node is and keeping some space. I'm not cutting right into the node or too close. I'm leaving about a quarter of an inch to allow for some dieback, but the next growth will happen right out of this node. So again, the auxins have been removed. More cytokinins below will push out new growth at these lower buds that otherwise would not be growing if it was un unchecked and unpruned. Again, similarly over here, you can see that we pruned right above another node because we're going to encourage growth to come out at this point. So helpful tip number three. So far, we've removed the fruit. Helpful tip number one, two, we've pruned, kept the tree back in check in regards to manageable size. The third thing we're going to do now is whitewash. And what we're going to do is we're going to whitewash with the Ivory Organics 3-in-1 Plant Guard, which offers protection from damaging summer sunburn, and in the winter, winter sun skulls. So thereby curbing weather extremes also serves as a repellent against insects and rodents. And the way it works out is it's got these seven natural oils, which include castor, cinnamon, clove, garlic, peppermint, rosemary, and spearmint. In addition to these base ingredients, which are based on traditional methods of limestone and clay, also has diatomaceous earth, another pest repellent protection. And the cool thing is, aside from being armory certified, meaning commercial orchards can rely on it for their organic gardening, it also dries on your plants porously, unlike latex and tar-based products, which trap moisture. And most research will say, don't put it on your plants because it'll contribute and add towards underlying rot. So again, the fact that it's a breathable protection allows you to use the product even as a foliar spray where you can spray the entire plant structure, including the leaves, in the dilute form. A pint-sized can such as this can make up to five gallons of the foliar spray. You can even make a smaller, maybe one or two gallon tank sprayer and spray your entire nursery plants, your backyard orchard, whatever needs to be done in order to curb those weather extremes. And then plus the three-in-one plant guard offers that sunburn protection. There's also the whitewash formula, which is oil-free and doesn't necessarily focus so much on the insect and rodent repellent protections, but again, offers all the same common ingredients for curbing weather extremes. And last but not least, the products are available in five different colors. So if white is not the look you're going for, you can go with brown or green or gray or grayish to best match the bark of the tree that you're looking to offer protection to. And the number one question we get after um, talking about the colors is which one is best. White is our best seller, naturally reflects the most amount of light and heat, thereby keeping the plant the coolest. But regardless of your shirt, and this is another hot day here in Los Angeles, and I'm wearing a dark color, but when I take off my shirt later on today, my skin below this is white. The rest of my skin is getting color and getting some burn. So um, again, regardless of the color you put on your plant, all the colors are offering protection to those protected trees. Again, colors brown, green, gray, and grayish, aside from the common three-in-one color white. So when you get the can, the product is shipped to you dry. It'll come with the base powders, 
and will include the oil vials, which as we mentioned earlier, include castor cinnamon, clove, garlic, peppermint, and rosemary. And those are bubble wrapped in this oil vial like so. And what we're gonna do is add the base powders to the can like so, add the oil, and then we're gonna add the water. I like going about halfway up first and then stirring it to get it more into a paste type consistency, getting all the powders in contact with the water. As that happens, as you can see here, I'm now gonna add more water. And I'm gonna go with this consistency. If you fill it up to the top, and it even says so in the directions, and I'll put the label in the video description below so you can read more about it. So the back of the label shows that the product can be used as a um, tree paste or a brush on direction or a foliar spray, depending on the volume of water added to the product. And so we're just gonna mix it. I'm gonna go with this consistency. Again, if I follow the brush on directions, it's gonna require that I fill up the can to the top with water, and that's gonna result in about a 50-50 diluted paint consistency. I'm gonna stick with this, and let's now start applying it. So all the branches that have a lot of sun on it, and keep in mind, in the Northern Hemisphere, it's just the South and Southwest side of the tree that's getting all the sun. The North and Northeast side of the tree is always in the shade. Most people have the misconception that the sun is equally divided around all sides of the tree, and that's not the case. If you're at the equator, it's more central with the plant, um, and the light is more evenly distributed. But if you're north or south of the equator, if you're in the northern hemisphere again, it's going to be the south and southwest side. If you're in Australia, it's just the opposite. So what we're going to do is basically touch up all of the parts that have too much light hitting it. And all of this could otherwise contribute to sunburn. And once it's burned, depending on the extent of it, a third degree burn could take years and maybe even a decade, if maybe never, to heal over. So um, we're just basically focusing on the upper branches or those branches that you see actually a lot of light penetration. And until the plant develops its own canopy, which I'm hoping happens in the upcoming few weeks, maybe in the next month or two, we're offering that plant that protection between now and then. We're even coating all of those pruned surfaces as well as we have created up here. And here, I'm gonna actually go with the white a little bit so you can see it in the light. Side by side comparison. Check that out. Doesn't that look like so natural? It doesn't even look whitewashed. But it's offering that protection that again will prevent the plant from even experiencing a first degree burn. Here, let's do another example here. I'm going in with color gray. So again, a side-by-side -side comparison to see grayish compared to color white. How cool is that? So the commercial organic orchards, if they were to use paint or tar products, could compromise their organic licenses. And again, at the end of the day, the goal is if you're growing your own food, the goal is to be growing the healthiest and best produce and ultimately growing the healthiest plants. And by having tar and paint flakes in your soil indefinitely, as those are designed to last 100 years or more, Ivory Organics give you, gives you the organic alternative. and um, and we hope you consider it for your organic growing needs. Helpful tip number four is fertilizer. But under the category of fertilizer, when you check out the Ivory Organic Super and Premium Blend fertilizers, at ivoryorganics.com, you'll see the labels with also, it explains on the back, all of the uses of this versatile fertilizer, which includes, the reason I'm surrounded by these products right now, it discusses the importance of compost, it discusses the importance of wood chips and mulching, and then it also discusses, first and foremost, the importance of what Ivory Organics all-purpose fertilizers can do for your garden. And the reason Ivory Organics, which is, again, an innovative, organic, effective, USA-made product, and the reason we entered the fertilizer um, product and making it available to growers across the country and around the world 
is because it offers your plants all of these six macronutrients. 90 plus percent of the education out there say plants only have three macronutrients, and that is not true. If we're simply talking about macronutrients, the answer is, and you can Google this, there's six macronutrients. Everybody's most familiar with the three primary macronutrients, which include nitrogen and for basically the greening and growing of the plant. And then there's P for phosphorus, which helps with the flowering and fruiting of your plants. And then there's letter K for potassium, and potassium offers your plants disease resistance, root strength and development, among other benefits. And really all three work together hand in hand in accomplishing all of these goals that I just explained. But the other three macronutrients, also known as secondary macronutrients, which again, macro means needed in abundance, include calcium, which consists of upwards of 30% of the plant's dry weight. Calcium is in the cell walls of all of the plants and is an important integral element. Also, sulfur is important for the metabolic processes of the plants, and magnesium is the heart of the chlorophyll molecule. So your six macronutrients are your N, P, K, M, G, S, C, A, and Ivory Organics all-purpose fertilizers, both super and premium blend fertilizers have it all. The premium blend is just a little lower on the N, P, K, but the super blend also has plus azomite, which is simply crushed volcanic rock. To offer your plants a lot of the micronutrient nutrition as well. And what we're going to do, again, following the directions that you'll find here on the back, and again, some of these categories discuss soil directions and for established three years and older trees, vegetables and annuals, foliar feeding, nutritional sprays, and even as a supplement to your compost tea as well. Again, educational lessons we've done in the past already. But let's open these up so I can kind of explain the differences of specific topic of we're going to do compost, mulch with wood chips, and then fertilizer. So we've taught over the years how to make your own compost. Currently our compost pile doesn't have any available compost. So if you were to just pick some up from your local big box store, this is a couple of products I've used for many years. And um, this one over here is grow mulch and it says specifically for planting your trees. I just wanna share with you the difference. I kind of like these about equally. So again, this here more so for trees and it's a little bit more coarse in my experience than the next product which i'm going to share with you so here's again grow mulch versus the amend product and if we open this very similar almost identical ingredients it's just that this one is just a little bit more fine when it breaks down so you take a look at that the parts are just a lot smaller. This, this one is usually typically recommended for planting your color spots and or vegetables and herbs and stuff. Again, because it's more fine, it'll break down faster and be more readily available to the plants. So following the instructions on the back of your bag, it simply recommends, and again, this is one of the only fertilizer products I've ever seen that actually shares with you the importance of compost and again, mulch with your wood chips plus fertilizer. And you'll find here on the back that it says, to apply about a quarter of an inch of compost. And so all I'm gonna simply do is take a few handfuls of the product like so, and I'm going to just start scattering it in the root zone of the tree like so. Nothing too scientific about it. Here we go. Some in the front, some in the back. If you look in the understory of the tree, you'll see that there's quite a bit of leaves. And historically, if you get past the leaves, there is and should be still some wood chips from years past that have been added. Let me get to the other side. The next thing we're going to do is apply the fertilizer and it's a granular product when supplied around the soil area will basically break down over the next three months so feeding at this time will last your plants about three months it's recommended to apply in spring let's say come february march especially if you're in the warmer climate such as us and then again three months later so may or june and then one last time in early fall to basically make sure the plant has everything it needs going into winter hibernation. And we're simply gonna take the product like so, and we're gonna scatter around the base of the tree. A 
I'm now going to simply go with my hand tool, try to get the fertilizer down below the leaf litter. And now we'll tackle the other side of the tree. Here we go again. I'm just adding a few tablespoons around the plant. This is the month of, again, late June going into July. First day of summer, which was about a couple weeks ago, is the longest day of the year. So we're talking about 14 hours of daylight. Plants metabolism, as you saw with all of that fruit too, is peaking and it needs all of the elements it can possibly get. And the most important month of the year for fertilizing your plants is May. So all of these organics can break down and be readily available to your plant come June. But here we are in late June going into July. And this tree needs food. We did not feed it in May as recommended. And we're paying the price right now. So again, this is again some of the education I'm hoping to bring you. We do make a lot of mistakes here on the property. And I hope to bring those mistakes to you. There's more upcoming lessons sharing some growing failures so hopefully you don't make those mistakes and you guys can just continuously enjoy your growing successes so part of this feeding tip number four is we just did the adding compost we added some fertilizer but now you're also going to want to mulch your trees too and having and again it's on the back side of the label and again i'll put it in the video description below so you can hit it and read all of the details that are available on the ivoryorganics.com website and so what we're going to do now is we're going to add a layer, a two to four inches, it says, but I think two to three is actually even better um, layer of wood chips. And um, you can actually see some of this white that's in here. This is part of a mycorrhizal or fungal action that's happening. And again, I'm not so concerned about this because it'll take its own life here on our property. But the goal is by doing organic gardening is you're feeding the earthworms, you're feeding the beneficial bacteria, you're feeding the beneficial mycorrhiza, which this is, the white stuff you see it growing on the wood chips. And we're going to add a nice healthy layer of wood chips around the tree. And what this is going to do is what we're going to do for helpful tip number five, sneak peek, is water. And what the wood chips are going to do, it's going to help retain upwards of 60 to 70 percent of the water so they don't have to water as frequently and naturally by mulching it's going to suppress weeding by upwards again of 70 to 80 percent also when the wood chips break down it's bringing nutrition to the soil as well and feeding your plant and those are just a few of the many reasons that you should all consider mulching with wood chips around all of your fruit trees on your property what this is also doing for your plants in the summer is it's keeping basically like a blanket keeping the soil cool in the winter months it actually has the reverse effect of keeping the soil warmer and again by curbing those weather extremes just as we did with whitewashing by curbing those weather extremes your plants are going to be a lot happier helpful tip number five is water most people don't know how to water when to water how frequently to water and the answer is it all depends the goal is when watering your plants, and this is going to take a while, so I'm just going to start watering from now, but the goal is you want to soak the root zone. You're going to want to soak it so that that water is going down at least two, three, four feet deep. Like You're going to want to make sure that entire root zone is soaked, but then here's the, the key most important thing is that you allow the soil to dry out between waterings, but never bone dry. So depending on the time of the year, whether it's spring or summer, that amount of watering may change. For example, in spring here in Los Angeles, a watering of once and maybe twice a week will be sufficient. But in the summer, it's going to be closer to probably two and even sometimes, and many of you probably don't know this, this lemon tree is not in the ground. It's basically a raised bed. And your raised beds and your container plants may need watering daily in order to um, basically meet that threshold of drying out but never bone dry. Because once it's bone dry, that's when your plant's going to stress. And if it's continuously wet, it's going to contribute to root rot. So by making sure you soak your plants and then wait. And again, in the winter months, you might only water your plants once or never, depending on if it rained that month, that might be all the water it needs. And again, keep in mind also the light hours are totally different. Here in Los Angeles, for example, our light hours are only 10. Temperatures are cool. Plants metabolism is year long low. And it doesn't need as much water. It doesn't need as much fertilizer. It doesn't need as much resources. And so be mindful of that as you're caring and feeding and watering and pruning and doing all these things is 
Again, it all depends on where you're at, what your climate's doing, and watch your plant and respond to it. You know, just as you would your pet dog or cat or bird, your plants are your pets too, and they require some TLC as well. So if you've enjoyed this educational lesson, be sure to give us that thumbs up, share us with your gardening friends and family. For those of you that are new, be sure to subscribe and hit that push bell notification so you can stay connected with all of our educational lessons as soon as they become made available. And as always, keep growing with Ivory Organics and wishing you all happy gardening.